On this Tuesday night, we look at the world's mass migration of people and the social and political challenges for the countries they seek out. In Canada, a mayor pleads for help as a housing crush overwhelms Toronto. In the U.S., a fiery immigration debate reignites after a travel ban gets the judicial OK. And in Europe, a champion of refugees may be on the edge of defeat. Also tonight, as Canada gets set to strike back at U.S. tariffs, MPs get an earful from business owners calling for more action right now. Parliament isn't sitting, but the heat is on. This is The National. Canada's biggest city says it can no longer handle the influx of refugee claimants and asylum seekers alone. A new report describes Toronto's shelter system as under unprecedented pressure. And as the CBC's Salima Shivji tells us, Mayor John Tory has put out an urgent call for immediate help. Jamil Bello has called this place home for the past month. A college dorm, but he's not a student. He's a refugee claimant from Nigeria, living in uncertainty. It's, it's a difficult life to live, you know. One, I would prefer to have a house. Across town, a different college dorm, the same uncertainty, coupled with gratitude. You know, I have to run for my life. And I believe since I've been here, I am more comfortable. That comfort will be short-lived. By August, students will be moving back in and the refugee claimants will have to leave. Well, how do we go? Where do we go? Nobody knows about that. So we'll just wait to take it a day as it comes. And whatever happens, I know the government is not going to leave us on the streets. But with asylum seekers arriving in large numbers across Canada, many are landing in Toronto, which now says its shelter system is overwhelmed, struggling to house more than 3,000 refugee and asylum claimants in addition to the city's homeless. From Toronto's mayor today, a plea. We need help. We cannot continue to do this alone. We just don't have uh, the resources to do it alone, and we just don't have the personnel. Who... A message aimed at both the provincial and federal governments. There is a plan for a triage system that would send refugee and asylum claimants outside major cities. It's working in Quebec, but in Ontario, there's a hiccup. Uh, the challenge is that we've had an election, and, and as a result of that, um, the, the money's in Ottawa waiting to be spent, but, but Ontario needs to ask for it and, and, and uh, share with us the plan they have to spend it. A waiting game as Toronto officials worry about a temporary housing system that's nearly at its breaking point. All right, thank you so much. Bye. Salima Shivji, CBC yeah. News, Toronto. Now, the situation in Toronto isn't just about the sheer number of asylum seekers coming into the country, but also in how their claims are getting stuck in the system. You see, while the flow of refugee claims has grown dramatically, funding for the board that reviews those claims has not. Even before these waves were coming in, you know, uh, we as the Canadian Bar Association and, and private practitioners were saying that, you know, the Immigration Refugee Board needed to staff up, that we need to get more board members. The result is a backlog that grows by the month. It's gone from about 43,000 cases at the beginning of the year to more than 57,000 as of the end of May. For claimants, that means longer and longer wait times. It used to be around 60 days. Now, 20 months. That in itself incentivizes more border jumping. This is then snowballing into a problem where there's more delays, which, you know, Due to the delays, people are getting work permits, they're hanging around the country longer, and that's encouraging people to then come across. So more gets stuck in the holding pattern until claimants are either accepted or turned away. In the meantime, they need to live somewhere. And until that backlog gets cut down, the pressure on housing is likely to get worse. In Europe, too, the wave of new arrivals day after day has brought the continent to yet another point of crisis. Some of today's developments. Werden wir auch in den nächsten Tagen weitere Gespräche führen. German Chancellor Angela Merkel meeting with Spain's Prime Minister, now saying a continental solution will not be reached by this week's summit of EU leaders. Also, the Lifeline, a ship full of rescued migrants, is finally allowed to dock in Malta after being refused port in Italy and floating in limbo in the Mediterranean Sea for five days. <laughs> And this was the show of force at the Austrian border with Slovenia. Police cadets acting as migrants with hundreds of police and military carrying out so-called migrant control exercises. 
And worth mentioning, Austria, with its hardline position against migrants, will soon be taking on the role of the EU presidency. And now to another border where government force has been on display. Today, the U.S. sent clear messages to ward off asylum seekers from its southern frontier. Vice President Mike Pence told an audience in Brazil that migrants from Central America need to build their lives there, not in the United States. And on Thursday, Pence takes that message to Guatemala, where he'll meet leaders from there, Honduras, and El Salvador. Together, they are the largest source of migrant families recently separated by U.S. border agents and a major source of asylum seekers in general. In just one year, the Border Patrol detained 70,000 families from these countries and nearly 48,000 unaccompanied children. Now, the CBC's Kim Brunhuber met one young migrant fleeing death threats in El Salvador. A lucky break helped him find friends in the U.S., but his luck may be running out. Nina. Girl. Carl. Yeah, do yeah. you like? Yeah, I like. His name is Kevin. I've been asked not to reveal his last name because he came from El Salvador to the U.S. illegally. Now the 22-year-old believes the American president wants him and everyone like him deported, while others in El Salvador want him dead. Imagine checking your voicemail and hearing this. It says, essentially, we drove by your house and you weren't there. Do you think your mother will enjoy watching as we kill you? Last summer, back in El Salvador, his family got into a dispute with a relative who, it turned out, belonged to one of the most violent gangs in the Americas. I was beaten, threatened, and it was a life I didn't want to live, he says. His father had snuck into the U.S. illegally years ago. So in December, Kevin crossed the Rio Grande in a raft, then got caught. And because the detention facility was full, they sent me to prison, he says. Kevin might have stayed in detention for years like some migrants he met, if not for a chance meeting about 10 years ago. I met him at Home Depot. Uh, Artist Matthew Monahan met Kevin's father in L.A., and the two became friends. So when the family learned what happened to Kevin, they paid his bond and flew him here to be reunited with his dad until his asylum hearing. It was, Monahan says, his own stand against Donald Trump. And the fact that there was one case, one way that I could concretely help was... Uh, was empowering. But in recent months, Kevin's situation has become much more precarious. First, Trump ended a humanitarian program that had allowed hundreds of thousands of Salvadorans to stay in the U.S. Then, his attorney general ordered judges to stop granting asylum to most victims of gang violence. There went Kevin's plan. As more and more people are trying to escape the vi from gang violence and... 11-year-old Tingri Monahan was so touched by Kevin's situation, she focused her major math project on the statistics explaining why migrants like Kevin are showing up by the thousands at the border. What I'm doing right now is just having my voice be heard and, like, showing, like, to the public and to the community that this stuff matters. Thanks to the Monahans, the community raised $30,000 for Kevin's legal fees. Oh, this is one of the classrooms. Seeing Tingri's school for the first time, Kevin can't help but think back to his own childhood. I was so happy, full of dreams and plans, he says, not worried about anything. Now Kevin worries that because the U.S. will no longer grant asylum to those fleeing gang violence, he could get deported, possibly even before his court date in August. It's inevitable, he says. If I go back, they'll kill me. It's Kevin shows me a picture of his best friend in the black. The back of his head is just gone. He was hacked to death by the same gang, Kevin says, that's looking for him. Very sad, he says. I am a boy. I am a boy. Oh, yeah. Then it's back to learning English, one word at a time. Movie. 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 Hoping that eventually he'll have a reason to use them all. Kim Brunhuber, <laughs> CBC News, Los Angeles. In Los Angeles today, protesters showed their frustration with Attorney General Jeff Sessions for his part in the separation of families seeking asylum. Sessions was scheduled to speak at a justice conference. I have a crowd just to be an unlawful assembly. Police the warned the crowd to disperse, then arrested 25 people, including a number of clergy. And in Washington, another show of anger. But here it's directed at today's Supreme Court ruling in favor of Donald Trump's travel ban. Critics say it unfairly targets Muslims. But 
prejudiced or not, Donald Trump, as president, has every legal right to do it, locking out travelers from several largely Muslim countries in the name of national security. As Paul Hunter reports, that has some worried. Who's next? No ban! No wall! No ban! Venting their anger, there remain all kinds of people in this country who oppose Trump's travel ban. The Statue of Liberty is weeping today. The Supreme Court has endorsed bigotry and Islamophobia. Trump's travel ban is immoral, it's disappointing, and it's wrong. But, ruled the court, banning travel to America for people from certain countries is entirely within the power of any president. It's a huge win for Donald Trump, and he knows it. A tremendous victory for the American people and for our Constitution. The key question for the court is the ban religious discrimination. On that, critics point to candidate Trump. Donald J. Trump is calling for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. And though the first version of the ban, soon after Trump took office, indeed targeted only certain majority Muslim countries, the current ban, the one studied by the court, includes as well non-Muslim countries. Trump's personal views, says the court, are irrelevant. The ban demonstrates, quote, a sufficient national security justification. A broad ruling viewed by this former federal immigration attorney under Barack Obama as now opening the door to other potential applications. So let's give an example. Let's say Justin Trudeau angers the president on trade. He could say, you know what, I'm not letting any Canadians in for 30 days. What do you think about that? Still, for the moment, the focus is on the countries on that list. And a decision today slammed by those insisting that Muslims remain Trump's real target. Unfortunately, as a nation, we still have a long way to go when it comes to equal protection and living the American ideals. Then again, as Trump backers would note, all he's really doing is putting America first, just as he said he would on the day he moved into the White House. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. Now, I should say, the Supreme Court decision was close, five to four. And one of the dissenting opinions came from Justice Sonia Sotomayor. She compared the ban to the internment of Japanese Americans during the Second World War. And upholding it, she said, merely replaces one gravely wrong decision with another, her words. It was a searing criticism, and it went on, in part. The United States of America is a nation built upon the promise of religious liberty, and that today's decision fails to safeguard that fundamental principle by leaving in place a policy first advertised as a shutdown of Muslims entering the United States, which now masquerades behind a facade of national security concerns. Well, on Parliament Hill today, industry leaders sounded the alarm about the potentially crippling cost of a trade war with the United States. Their dire warning about lost business and jobs comes ahead of Canada Day, which is when Canada retaliates against the U.S. Tariffs on American goods set to kick in. And as Katie Simpson tells us, many businesses are not looking forward to that or to the months to come. There is anxiety on the floor at the Owasco RV Centre. The family-run business outside of Toronto employs about 220 people, but some of those jobs are in danger because of the trade dispute with the U.S. If we have a big town downturn, I'm in trouble. That's all there is to it. Uh, my house, my family, everything's on the line. Owasco's president sat alongside other business leaders to share concerns with MPs who are studying the impacts the U.S. tariffs on steel and aluminum are having in Canada. What happens with you guys over the next four, six, 12 months? The bank account keeps going down and we're going to have to lay off more people. If we are unable to secure relief from the government of Canada, our business will be forced to close within a few months of July 1st. While some industry leaders are demanding financial aid, others want stronger measures. So we need to inflict pain on U.S. steel consumers, unfortunately. And that's where the, the pain has to be felt and the insurrection has to happen in the U.S. Canada is trying to inflict pain with a series of retaliatory tariffs on American goods kicking in on July 1st. But there is an understanding that traditional pressure points may not work with Donald Trump. You have to stop pretending we're dealing with a rational counterparty. 
uh, you know, these people are caging children at the border. So fears are now growing. The U.S. president could make a bad situation worse by imposing new tariffs on imported vehicles. A 25 percent tariff on cars and parts would cause what we like to call a Carmageddon. The industry operates on single digit margins and it would grind to immediate halt with a 25 percent increase in price. Ottawa says it is still finalizing a support plan for Canadian businesses caught in the middle of this trade dispute. But that's little comfort for business leaders who say they need help now. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. Now that support plan Katie just mentioned, it dominated another key meeting in Ottawa today. Finance Minister Bill Morneau sat down with his provincial and territorial counterparts to discuss how best to weather the storm of uncertainty caused by Donald Trump's trade tariffs and NAFTA negotiations. We absolutely are going to stand behind Canadian businesses who are challenged by these tariffs. We're going to stand behind uh, Canadians, Canadians who are employed in the steel industry, but Canadians who are impacted by these tariffs. Uh, we will be uh, talking more about that in the coming days. Meanwhile, Quebec's premier took trade concerns directly to Washington today. He tweeted out this picture with U.S. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross. Quebec's finance minister said the talks were frank and conveyed the clear message that U.S. tariffs are unjustified. Okay, we're tracking a number of other developing stories this hour. One of them, a security scare in one of Russia's World Cup host cities. This is the scene tonight outside a hotel in the southern city of Rostov-on-Don. It was evacuated by Russian police, reportedly due to a bomb threat. Police have since said they received multiple threats targeting a number of venues there, but they say after checking everything, no sign of any bomb. Takesha is alive and has always been alive, and this decision does not change that. The family of Takesha McKitty lost its legal battle today to keep her on life support. She was declared brain dead almost a year ago after a drug overdose. She's been on life support ever since, her family citing religious reasons, but a judge has ruled against them. The family has 30 days to appeal. And a big court decision today in a high-profile polygamy case in British Columbia. Winston Blackmore and James Oler will not be spending time in jail. Instead, they got house arrest and probation. The two former religious leaders were convicted last year of practicing polygamy in the community of Bountiful. Blackmore had 24 wives. Oler had five. And here's a look at what else we're working on tonight on The National. Police say the former head of Ontario Children's Aid Society placed 10 children with sexually abusive foster parents. Just ahead, a former foster child tells her story. Plus. It answers your questions, plays your music, it can even drive cars. But can artificial intelligence script a movie? Diane Buckner looks at how AI can shape perhaps more than we think. And, well, just look at this. Willie O'Ree! Hey! Willie O'Ree's hometown of Fredericton reacting to the news that he'll join the Hockey Hall of Fame. We'll bring you his reaction next week. It was a special day for six people who got the call. They're being inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame as part of the class of 2018. Among them, Willie O'Ree, who broke the color barrier in hockey and overcame a lot to make it to the NHL. Now, he played just two seasons, but as Joanna Romiliotis shows us, decades later, O'Ree's impact still echoes. The best part of this story is where it starts, at Willie O'Ree's hometown haunt. Crammed today with friends and fans, nervously waiting, straining to hear this. Willie O'Ree! Hey! Willie will be 83 this fall. Uh, everybody says it's high time, but I think he's had to earn his way all the way through life. So this is just the top of the mountain. It was the greatest thrill of my life, I believe. Willie O'Ree broke barriers as the first black player in the NHL. His first game was with the Boston Bruins in 1958. Sixty years later, the call at his home in San Diego was another pinch-me moment. You know, I was laughing and I was uh, crying and uh, I was uh, just so excited uh, 
to hear the news. Incredible, too, because being black was only part of O'Ree's extraordinary story. An injury as a junior player had left him blind in his right eye. He kept it a secret when he got his first professional break in Quebec City. So uh, I played that year. We won the championship, and that's what gave me the extra confidence that I needed. I says I can do anything I set my mind to do if I feel strongly within my heart and within my mind. O'Ree went on to play 45 games in the NHL and still works as its diversity ambassador. Promoting hockey is for everyone, a program that encourages kids of color to play the game. The ultimate hockey dad, Carl Subban, has two sons in the NHL, including P.K. Subban. O'Ree, he says, inspired them and many more. He's telling his story in a way to inspire young people. He's saying to young people, you know what? It's okay to have a dream. It's okay to have a big dream. A couple of days ago, Jermaine Lowen became the first Jamaican-born player drafted by the NHL. He hopes O'Ree's legacy will become part of his own too. I just want to try to carry the torch if I can, in any way I can, you know, uh, kids looking up to me from the bottom, bottom up and they can see who I am. As for O'Ree, his legacy is a living one. His message to kids, now a mantra. Don't let anybody tell you you can't attain your goal. If you feel strongly within your heart and within your mind, then, then go for it. And don't, uh, and don't worry about anything else because you'll regret. If you don't, if you don't try, you'll, re you'll regret it. And one thing O'Ree will tell you, when it comes to the game, he has no regrets. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. Now, major professional sports leagues across North America have made strides towards greater diversity in both the locker room and the boardroom over the years. But the face of the NHL still remains predominantly white. Only about 5% of its players are black, while in Major League Baseball it's 8%, and both those numbers don't even come close to what you see in other North American sports leagues. 69% of players in the NFL are black, and it's 81% in the NBA. And one more thing. I mentioned there were six inductees altogether, including Willie O'Ree into the Hockey Hall of Fame. The others are Martin Brodeur, considered one of the greatest goaltenders of all time. Longtime Tampa Bay Lightning star Martin St. Louis, Canadian Olympic and world champion Jaina Hefford also there. And on the list as well, Russian hockey great Alexander Yakushev and NHL commissioner Gary Bettman. It's still to come on The National. Can computers predict what movies people will want to see? We'll introduce you to two Canadian tech companies hoping to code success at the box office. We have about 40,000 display attributes in the system. Oh. So anything you can essentially think of, we can check. What would be good, what would be bad, what combination of them would help a story um, you know, to, to create more demand. You may have seen Adrienne's reports from Mali this week. While there, she asked Canada's chief of the defense staff about the length of Canada's commitment to its newest peacekeeping mission. One year. What would change that? Nothing. Nothing? <laughs> uh, I think it's a hard date, Adrian. So clearly, Vance is putting cold water on any notion of an open-ended commitment. But even a year will likely be difficult and dangerous. If the goal is propping up the government and protecting the population, the threat can come from any side. Take a UN investigation, which wrapped today. It says that the very local forces the mission is supporting, Malian troops, that they executed 12 civilians in a cattle market last month. It wouldn't be the first time, and it threatens to turn the population against the government. Today, Adrian raised the issue with a Dutch peacekeeper on the ground. How much do they trust the Malian army? Oh, it's, it's, it, it's not that good right now. Uh, they, they, I think it's really complex, and it's a long process. By being an example, and we hope that it will be better for, for the local population uh, too. Corruption, extremism, violence. As David Common explains, peacekeeping is always a challenge. But in Mali, that goes double. Canadian soldiers are entering a quagmire, a conflict even more complex than Afghanistan. They've been practicing for months to rapidly retrieve the injured and ferry international peacekeepers by air. 
but it's hard to prepare for what comes next. A nation struggling with a peace deal that never took hold, where even those welcoming us in are invested in keeping up the fight. There's no clear good guys or bad guys. Terrorism researcher Aisha Ahmed travels regularly to Mali. So one of the biggest problems we have isn't necessarily that we have really tough rivals, but that we have really bad allies. Those allies, the ones who agreed to peace, not only keep fighting, but are connected to corruption. And, says Professor Ahmed, the drug trade. Those groups are implicated in cocaine trafficking, in illicit business, and have fi become financially incentivized to maintain a status quo when they regularly fight against each other for control over these turfs. That difficult dynamic filters back here to UN headquarters in New York. They know of the challenges. And one of those who helped create the mission warns of the dangers. You should expect uh, hostile force. You should expect uh, attacks on convoys. Uh, you should expect uh, IED threats, etc. Arto Butelas is still involved in the peace effort. He points out most of the peacekeepers aren't as well equipped as the Canadians. So Ottawa's under pressure to give more. If Canada were contributing in addition to the helicopter unit, uh, some infantry, for instance, that would very much be welcome because, again, I think that experience would be relevant. Uh, right now is not the case. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, you know, once Canada uh, get a sense of the, the realities on the ground, having the helicopter unit, maybe uh, the country would then consider uh, expanding its contribution. Sending six helicopters was actually just a starting point for the planners here at the United Nations. They have asked Canada for a lot more. Send troops, send police, send more money, increase the amount of time that you're there. But the Canadians, who heralded a return to the world stage under the Trudeau government, have so far been reluctant. Any government needs to take extremely seriously the responsibility uh, involved in sending Canadian uh, troops uh, potentially into harm's way around the world. The feds may well have looked at Mali and realized how much of a mess it has become. But as the Trudeau government lobbies for a seat on the UN Security Council, any contribution to peacekeeping looks good. The deployment all part of a larger political game whether it can achieve peace, that's another story. Peacekeepers are not there to impose peace or to force peace on the national actors. It is for the national actors uh, to achieve peace. Professor Ahmed agrees, but isn't convinced the warring groups even want peace. The problem with this particular mission is that the intervention itself is not leading to that outcome. And so for that reason, I'm deeply concerned that our men and women in uniform would be put into a situation where they are potentially being handed an unwinnable war. Their deployment has now begun. By August, they'll be fully operational. David Common, CBC News. By the way, David has a full-length interview with Aisha Ahmad, the researcher you saw in his piece. You can see it on cbc.ca slash the national. Now, Canada's peacekeeping contribution in Mali is new, but this country has been contributing there in other ways for years. In humanitarian and development aid, Canada has given about a billion dollars to Mali over the past decade. And the country has long been a focus for other international donors as well. Over the past 50 years, Western countries have given an estimated $100 billion. To experts, that suggests the UN is in this for the long haul. Hopefully, uh, over a period of a decade, the mission will be able to decrease in, in size. But um, I foresee that we'll, there will be need to be a UN presence there over the coming election and into subsequent elections to make sure that Mali stays on track and that this major international investment is not lost. This investment is strategic, humanitarian, but also economic. You see, there are mining opportunities in Mali. So Canadian mining companies have also invested more than a billion dollars in the country. And while Adrian and her team were in Gao, they snapped some terrific pictures of the Canadian advance team as it landed. You can find them on our Instagram page, at CBC The National. 
And we've got a number of other developing stories on our radar this hour, including that search underway in Thailand for a young soccer team missing inside a flooded cave. They are praying for good news outside the cave as the search for the 12 boys and their coach moves into its fourth day. Officials say they still hope to find the team alive, but so far the search has been difficult. Crews are now trying to pump water out of the cave so it's safer for Navy SEAL divers to operate. U.S. media are reporting tonight that White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders is getting Secret Service protection. Officials won't say why the decision was made, but it comes after Sanders was asked to leave a restaurant because of her role with the Trump administration. Additional security is reportedly being added at her home on a temporary basis. And that was Prince William in Jerusalem today, laying a wreath at a memorial for victims of the Holocaust. His trip is the first official visit to Israel by a member of the British royal family. He'll be touring the region until Thursday. Tomorrow, he's expected to travel to the West Bank to meet with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas. Well, now to two stories of Canadian children separated from their families and how the system failed to keep them safe. Ron Charles begins our coverage in southern Ontario, where guardians under the umbrella of children's aid were sent to jail for awful crimes. And now the justice system wants accountability from the administrator who was in charge. I didn't know, obviously, the behavior was very inappropriate. When MK was a 15-year-old in 2006, the Prince Edward County Children's Aid Society placed her in a foster home run by a young couple, Joe and Janet Home. MK, whose identity is under a publication ban, remembers what happened when one of two other teenage girls in the home complained to Children's Aid about Joe Holmes' sexually inappropriate behavior. They had asked us if that had actually happened, and we said yes. We witnessed this happening, and he was told not to do it again. And it was left at that. So when the behavior began to progress with me, I almost kind of felt in a sense that this was normal. That Over the next three years, Joe sexually abused MK. Janet covered it up. Like we were actually even told by my foster mother that uh, my, foster, my foster father was not to be present when they would do the annual visits. And that was actually, that was actually a suggestion from people who worked at Children's Aid um, because he was not necessarily able to cover up his behavior. The Holmes pleaded guilty in 2011 to a number of sexual abuse offenses against MK and other children in their care. A judge sentenced him to four years in prison, her to three. But theirs wasn't the only case. Another four Prince Edward County foster parents were convicted of sexually abusing their foster children. So many convictions in such a small jurisdiction led the government to launch a review of the county's Children's Aid Society. It found a poorly run dysfunctional CAS rife with infighting that interfered with planning and placement of children. Appropriate screening and assessment requirements for foster homes were often not met. And the CAS had no clear and cohesive response to allegations of sexual abuse. Now, six years later, the society's former executive director is facing criminal negligence charges for running a CAS that ended up fostering children with abusers. William Sweet declined to comment when CBC knocked on his door in Picton, Ontario. No, I'm sorry. I'm not interested in speaking Oh, to you sure? Thank I just you. wanted to ask you about the charges. The Prince Edward County CAS was merged six years ago into a larger regional society headed by Mark Cartouche. You know, making sure that we followed the right processes for approvals of homes and then the oversight and, and how we work together with homes. We did some staff training and we helped enhance some of the management training. MK says she and the other abused former foster children will follow Sweet's trial closely. I hope that this is an eye-opener for them for sure. And I hope that the agencies can be mindful of the people that they are allowing to be foster parents. Sweet will be back in court next month. Ron Charles, CBC News, Picton, Ontario. Now, the issue of child protection was also top of mind in Alberta today, with a call for the province to do more to battle opioid addiction among young people. We're calling in our, in our report for, for that substance use education to be embedded in the school curriculum and that it's for it to take place both in elementary and into the high school grades. 
The plea for a youth-specific drug strategy comes from Alberta's child and youth advocate. It follows his review of 12 deaths, tragic stories of teens who died from opioid overdoses over a two-year period while wrestling with family breakdown, crime, and other issues. Harm reduction can open the door to a relationship, and that can lead to positive influence towards healthier behavior. Among the other recommendations, more training for frontline workers who deal with children to recognize signs of addiction and intervene early, with an added focus on young people with mental health or cognitive problems. Also, a mention that family and close friends should play a role in treatment. The government says it's reviewing those recommendations. And it's not just young Canadians who can find themselves targeted in places meant to be safe. As LGBTQ people grow older, they can sometimes be forced back into the closet to avoid discrimination. Our Nick Purden will have that story tomorrow. Here's a preview. I'm not afraid of dying. I'm, what I'm afraid of is the time from now until the time that I do die. Going into a senior's home, it's... Do you worry that people might treat you differently because you're gay? I do. This one nurse came in and said to me, look at you, you're a mess. It's bad enough that you're one of those, and now I have to come and clean you up. And for the whole time she was cleaning me, she kept making homophobic remarks. I had some friends, and one of the things they asked me was that, you know, could you stand in the doorway? If a personal service worker or a nurse would go by, signal us, because we don't want to be seen holding hands or embracing. Remember, you can get a little bit of The National in your inbox earlier in the day. Every weekday, The National Today goes deep on several notable stories and explores stories you might have missed. In today's newsletter, after a series of embarrassing revelations about lax driver screening and safety problems, Uber gets the green light to continue operating in London under strict new conditions. Subscribe at cbcnews.ca slash the national. Good afternoon, Ms. Ocean. As you know, parole is a privilege. For years now, Hollywood found safety in sequels. This month alone, we've already seen the release of Ocean's 8. In three and a half weeks, the Met will be hosting its annual ball. And we are going to rob it. Bye, sweetie. The return of the Parr family in Incredibles 2. You know it's crazy, right? To help my family, I gotta leave it. To fix the law, I gotta break it. And a new breed of dinosaur in Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. This is the most dangerous creature that ever walked the earth. All three films had strong opening weekends at the box office, but maintaining that kind of momentum isn't easy. In fact, ticket sales for Incredibles 2 already took a nosedive this past weekend. And that's bad news for an industry that's already having a hard time filling seats. Last year, ticket sales fell to their lowest level in 25 years in both Canada and the United States, while at the same time, big-time movie makers seem to be investing more than ever before. Consider, of the most expensive movies ever made, the majority were from the last 10 years. So, how to turn things around? Well, the key may be in some Canadian-made technology that leans on machines to tell movie makers what's likely to succeed and what's not. The CBC's Diane Buckner shows us how. Let's get started. Creative minds getting to work. Black Swan meets Dexter. This group is on the hunt for the next great television series or even a blockbuster movie. If you think about, like, Gone Girl for Teens, this is... Yeah. This feels like a hit. They're talking about stories found on Wattpad, the successful online storytelling company they work for. Alicia's daily grind was wearing her down. She was sleepwalking through life and no amount of caffeine could wake her up. This corporate video explains how it works, how anyone can write stories or just read and comment on ones written by others. 65 million people use Wattpad worldwide. Anytime there was a twist, um, our community went wild. Their community is the barometer of what could be popular. How big is this one? It's just more Aaron Levitz is the head of Wattpad, Wattpad Studios, the new movie and TV so division. With that and the data that we have, audiences telling us, I love this story, I love this paragraph in this story, I love this character, I love this chapter, I don't love this chapter. We really felt that it was time to invest in that 
that knowledge that we had and only we have in a really unique fashion to be able to help the industries do better. Day in, day out, people floated by her. Strangers with only cursory familiarity, aiming for a quick fix, and then poof, off into the world. The app has already turned some of its online users into best-selling authors of actual books. Sure, let's take a look at one of my favorites currently, which is expiration date. Levitt says so, Wattpad's yeah, interactive there's, there's technology will help movie studios um, identify and develop scripts fantasy, that audiences yeah. will it pay really to is. see. This story is growing faster than any other story this week. This story got 15 comments before any other story got 15 comments. This story has six and a half times more reading time than any other story in that genre. And that signal brings it to the studio's attention. Would Flynn be working in the kissing booth? Absolutely. The data Wattpad gathers helped to create The Kissing Booth, a book that's now a movie on Netflix. It recently ranked as one of the four most popular movies in North America. What do you think? Contrast that with the latest in Hollywood's Star Wars franchise, Solo. It's struggling to break even. This movie, despite having made $180 million in 18 days, which by any scale is a pretty impressive number, they're saying it's going to lose money. It's the first Star Wars money movie to lose money. Jesse Wente runs film festivals and once ran a theater. He says the movie industry is threatened by new, serious competition. You can watch movies in a variety of ways that you just couldn't 10, 15 uh, years ago. Call it the Netflix effect. Streaming services have made it that much harder to get people out to theaters to pay for tickets and treats. In Kitchener, Ontario, meet Jack Zhang. His company has created software that uses artificial intelligence to cross-reference movie plots with how much money those movies made. So we have about 40,000 these plot attributes in the system. So anything you can essentially think of, we can check. What would be good, what would be bad, what combination of them would help a story, um, you know, to, to create more demand among the audience. He used the software himself to make a movie trailer. It worked. Despite a $30 budget, the video attracted 2.3 million views on YouTube, and that attracted investors. This is the first ever AI co-written feature-length film in the history. The best movies are the ones that are the most human, that are ones that are the most reflective of what it is to be alive and connect with us on that human level. Can an algorithm actually produce that? Considering the millions of dollars lost on box office bombs, such as A Wrinkle in Time, starring Oprah Winfrey and Reese Witherspoon, more movie studios may be willing to give technology a shot. Both Greenlight and Wattpad have big ambitions and marketing teams in Hollywood. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. Pretty fascinating stuff. So uh, normally, when you think destination wedding, you might think sun, sand, surf, and south, right? But one Ontario couple ticked the first three of those boxes, then they headed up. Shauna and Drew Mitchell's extremely northern nuptials is our moment of the day just ahead. And on both sides of the border, a lot of the immigration debate centers on asylum. Who deserves it? who abuses it. Adrian has been working on a story about one asylum seeker in the US, a Mexican journalist stuck in the system who says the stakes couldn't be higher. We'll have that for you on Thursday. Here's a sneak peek. So about a decade ago, Emilio Gutierrez was writing about corruption in the Mexican military. And that's when he was hunted and threatened and attacked by the Mexican military. So it was around that time that he tried to seek asylum in the United States, and this case has been winding its way through the courts ever since. An American judge decided that Emilio should be deported. So Emilio and his son have been in detention here in El Paso since December, and we've been trying to get in. And the final word is that, yes, we can, but we can only get audio, not video, which is what this is all about. There's so many questions to ask these two, including, you know, how long do you think you can hang on what exactly is likely to happen if you do get sent back to Mexico? We'll see what we get. Hello, Oscar. Oscar. I'm Adrian. Hi. Emilio. My first question for either one of you, but mostly you, Emilio, how are you? It's a nice experience, for the most desagradable, in donde 
Las autoridades buscan destruir la autoestima. What happens to Emilio if he gets deported? If he goes back home to Chihuahua, where he has his ancestral home, he's dead. They, they, would, they would kill him. Shauna and Drew Mitchell traveled a long way to get married. Their trip started in their hometown of Callender, Ontario. From there, they drove a few hours to Toronto and then flew to Whitehorse. Then they took the Dempster Highway from Inuvik to Tuktoyaktuk. Definitely not your typical wedding location, though it was on a beach. Their destination wedding is our moment of the day. And then we got engaged and we thought, well, why not get just married up there? We already had a family trip planned, so my parents uh, were already planning to be in Whitehorse and invited us all to come up for the summer solstice. And as soon as we got the idea to get married up here, I started <laughs> planning uh, with Google and just cold calls to various people. We were connected with uh, the Siglet drummers who were able to drum for us and um, basically made an aisle for me to walk down and uh, and then they gave us some some dancing lessons at the end as well. You know the community and the people just they, they're so friendly and they're so willing to help it's it's absolutely incredible. It was beautiful actually the weather turned out perfect. It was a beach and Shauna always wanted a beach wedding so it uh, it turned out. Yeah, I'll say. A beautiful location, that's to be sure. And, uh, you know, they had been planning that wedding for about a year, and, and obviously they had to plan it remotely. So Shauna said she was emailing a lot of people in the local community and feels like she became friends, close friends with a number of them, to the point where, for the actual wedding ceremony, she felt like she was surrounded by family and friends. And in the end, it wasn't just the wedding they celebrated. The day before the ceremony, they were celebrating with the local community for National Indigenous Peoples Day. So there you have it. That's The National for this Tuesday, June 26th. Thanks for joining us. Have a good night.